take a little bit of a uh, different direction here with uh, chordoma compared to the metastasis. Uh, here are my disclosures. There's no direct conflict. Uh, before I uh, start this talk, uh, I'll just show you a case of a 52-year-old uh, gentleman who basically presented with uh, progressive back pain for the past several months. And he's starting to develop some millisensory changes with paresthesia and weakness. And you can see his, on his MRI, he's got a little bit of epidural compression here. How many people would go ahead and do, an op, do uh, radiation on this? Anybody? How many people would operate on this right off the get-go? Okay. How many people would biopsy first? Okay. Thank you. So we'll, we'll touch upon some of those points. So, you know, but I, uh, when I treat spine tumor, I use this concept of MMM, and we all know that tumor patients have a lot of morbidity and, and mortality, so they do end up in our MMM conferences. But that's not what, really what I'm talking about. For tumors, for metastatic tumors, we're always weighing the balance between your surgical complication as well as your cancer or oncological result. And in tumor, in metastatic tumors, we want to minimize the complication from our treatment and improve the oncological or quality of life outcome. For primary tumors, it's very different. Uh, primary spine tumors, uh, there is a, there's a, a finite ability to achieve either a cure or long-term tumor control. And because of this, we tend to maximize our oncological outcome knowing um, that there are, there are uh, higher perioperative risks with some of our approaches. So primary vertebral body tumors are relatively rare. Metastatic tumor in the United States, there's about uh, 20,000 uh, symptomatic cases that require surgery a year, whereas uh, l there's less than probably uh, 7,000, uh, 7,500 cases that present with symptoms, a majority of them still do not require surgery. In general, primary spine tumors are really less than 5% of all your primary uh, bony tumors. Uh, in the younger population, the sarcomas are your most common uh, type of primary bone tumors. Uh, in the adults, uh, you know, plasma cytoma is really pr the primary vertebral tumors. However, it's not really, as you know, it's not a primary bone tumor. It's a lymphocytic tumor, a plasma cell tumor. In terms of primary uh, bony tumor in the adult, the most common is really chordoma. And it's the malignant uh, version of, um, of primary bone tumor that affects most of the adults. Chordoma is a rare disease, uh, but we're still all going to see it. Uh, the instance in the United States is, is estimated to be about 0.1 case per every 100,000, so about one a million disease. Uh, so for uh, Saudi Arabia, with the estimated population around 30, you're probably going to expect about 30 cases a year. The most common site of disease, about 40 to 50 percent of them can arise from the sacrum. Uh, these tend to be in the older uh, uh, individuals, uh, middle to late uh, middle ages. Uh, the clivus is the second most common site. This is a skull base, right, at the base of the skull that it presents mostly in adolescent and young adults. And then the mobile uh, spine ones are quite uh, rare, but generally if they're going to present, it's lumbar spine, cervical, uh, and thoracic in, in that particular order. Chordomas are thought to be remnants uh, from the nodal core, which is a... Uh, an embryonic structure that starts the differentiation of our spinal column and spinal cord. Uh, nodal cord remnants in adults should not be there, but there are some cases where you're going to see nodal cordal rest uh, cells or tumors, which are very small focal lesions that are bright on T2 on the MRI, but they're not locally invasive. Uh, there is an entity that's more rare, it's called atypical nodal cord tumors, which have a more aggressive behavior than your benign tumors. The benign ones don't progress, whereas the atypical one can progress. But generally, they're involving the whole vertebral body. Still, they do not infiltrate or pass beyond the periosteum in most cases. The most common form of presentation for chordoma is the classic chordoma. And these, uh, while uh, histologically benign, are quite invasive and have the potential of met metastasis. And the most uh, d severe cases are the differentiated uh, chordoma, which is a relatively sm small, rare subtype of chordoma, but they pr pretty much behave much more like the sarcoma. Uh, um, uh, histologically, they have this ben uh, very benign appearing uh, histology with these bubbly appearances called the uh, fossiliferous uh, cells. You don't see metas you don't see metodic figures, and you don't see high uh, KI67 ratings, and yet uh, these these tumors are very uh, locally aggressive, nevertheless. Uh, they're known for this uh, brachyuri uh, immunostaining. Uh, that's been defined as sort of the pathognomonic uh, immunological diagnosis for these chordomas. 
So in the natural history, despite the fact that these are uh, histologically benign appearing, uh, these are very locally invasive. These tumors uh, can spread into the surrounding uh, tissues beyond the osteum uh, and dif different, different barriers. When you do surgery that's subtotal or anterolegional excision, they tend to have a very high recurrence rate and ultimately uh, they possess um, metastatic potential and lead to gradual death in many of these patients with relatively poor quality of life. So, Medical treatment for chordoma, what's available? Unfortunately, chordomas are really uh, resistant to both your traditional chemo and radiation therapy. There is currently no chemotherapy that's approved for chordoma. While there are investigated agents available, none has been approved and shown to be consistently effective. Proton beam can provide better local disease control but than your external beam radiation. However, if you look at the proton beam therapy, majority of those patients are still going to have local progression, and many of those patients will still die about five to seven years later. Uh, targeted treatments are being currently investigated. There is a number of treatments that's directed to EGFR or PDGF receptors. There is also uh, 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 a lot of, uh, we actually are involved in a trial that is uh, a vaccine therapy that's targeted to the uh, brachiuri, uh, or, uh, brachiuri molecule that is being uh, currently tested, but they're all in the investigational stages at this point. So in terms of treatment uh, for chordoma and algorithm, because the medical treatments are, are ineffective for these patients, you have to have early clinical uh, suspicion and early detection in these cases because surgery is your, really your best chance to give these patients long-term survival. Anytime you have a suspicion of a potential for primary bone tumor that includes chordoma or other sarcoma, you want to get a biopsy first so that you can mark the tract and be able to potentially excise that tract as part of your surgery. Uh, and if there's any questions about uh, your histological uh, uh, analysis you want to send for even a staining of this brachy area, which again is fairly pathognomonic uh, for chordoma. So, because these medical treatment are largely ineffective, uh, and, and the uh, most ideal and state of the art treatment for chordoma remains to be the on block excision. Now, on block by definition is removing as a whole, but it doesn't mean that you won't leave tumor behind. Uh, what you have to be careful about is where is the uh, tumor uh, compartmentalized. And if you look at some of the Tamina study, uh, he looked at uh, almost 20, he looked at 19 specimen and look at where the tumors have spread and where are the natural barriers to, to prevent tumor uh, spreading. Uh, the, the best barriers are your anterior longitudinal li uh, uh, ligaments, your disc spaces, and your ligamental flavum. However, the periosteums and actually the uh, posterior longitudinal ligament are actually relative weak barriers. So knowing that um, th when they study these, they actually found majority of these uh, tumors can still behave in similar to skeletal uh, lesions uh, and tumors that are compartmentalized. And, and because of this, this on-block excision technique can be helpful for these patients. So in terms of on-block excision, it isn't just taking it out as a whole. It's really uh, watching the margins, and all of you who are orthopedics understand uh, and know the anakine classifications very well. Uh, based on uh, the uh, expansion of the anakine classification into the spine tumors, uh, you know, intralesional uh, incision is anytime you leave macroscopic uh, disease behind, so you're inside the tumor, most of your intralesional uh, excisions are going to fall into this category. Marginal excision is if you can dissect and remove the tumor off the pseudocapsule, but you can still leave skip lesions and satellite lesions behind. The most ideal treatment, if you can, is Y excision, just as you would expect in your long bone or radical excision. Radical excision does not really exist in the spine because you'll have to remi remove the entire spine from the skull base to the sacrum in order to achieve that. But Y excision and marginal excision is largely what we want to achieve in spine. Y excision is the ideal, but marginal excision is oftentimes the compromise we have to, uh, to um, address when we have, uh, when we have nerve involvements or uh, you know, dural margins to be uh, concerned about. 
Uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, in terms of cancer treatment, the American Joint uh, Cancer Committee on Cancer Treatment also identifies uh, the different ways of, of removing tumor and what the risk of local progression for some of these tumors are. Uh, based on that classification, mo uh, a R0 excision is any time you have a negative microscopic margin of at least one millimeter surrounding the tumor. And again, this is ideally what you want to achieve for your chordoma, and, and it's, it can be uh, a stretch in some of these cases. R1 is if you are less than a millimeter behind, this is your equivalent to the, uh, to the marginal excision. R2 is any time you have intraopid uh, tumor spillage or intralesional excision. Uh, we published a paper several years ago looking at our chordoma uh, uh, results. Uh, we published this uh, uh, at that time was one of the largest series of the uh, sacral chordoma removed by on block excision. All these chordomas were taken out in a posterior uh, approach. Margins were assessed uh, both in, uh, by the surgeons in surgery as well as the pathologists afterwards, and then we examined the perioperative outcome as well as the long term outcome. Again, these were all on blocks done uh, with the goal of achieving Y or, or marginal excisions. And we preserve nerve roots whenever we can to spare the, the blood and bowel function in cases we can without compromising the margins. So uh, despite our attempt to remove these and on block uh, excision to achieve Y margin in all these cases, we are only successful in about 70% of the cases because of the anatomy. And about 30% of the time, we did have either intraopid uh, contamination because of tumor capsule violation. Uh, we also have five others that were identified to be, uh, uh, to have capsule violation after the surgery. Uh, the, you can see these patients have a long hospital stay, almost two weeks, we had one death and the complication rate from a wound infection was almost 50% in these cases uh, because of the large wound defect. However, when you look at the mean uh, disease-free survival for these patients, you can see that there's a widespread uh, difference between marginal Y on block uh, excision uh, in these tumors uh, compared to any time we have intralesional or uh, vi uh, capsule violation. The difference was 71.3 months uh, compared to about two years uh, for disease-free survival. Uh, if you look at the results from Boriani's group where they uh, published their 50 years of experience for chordoma uh, the spine, you can see that those who have radiation and palliative surgery, they had 10 patients. Uh, at the follow-up, all 10 of those patients were uh, dead. Uh, for those who had interlesional uh, lesion plus radiation, uh, 12 of them had local progression and recurrences. On the other hand, those patients who had wire on block margin excision with or without radiation had a high uh, uh, number of patients that uh, no evidence of disease. So again, why an on-block excision is really your goal. Uh, finally, another study uh, that was published most recently, uh, and this is a retrospective uh, uh, a study from multiple centers that are very experienced in treating chordomas. This uh, looked, looked at 166 patients, which was the highest uh, number of patients study. Uh, majority of these patients are late to middle ages. Again, most of the tumors uh, in the mobile spine will arise from lumbar and cervical spine. These are more challenging because now we have functioning nerve roots we're dealing with. About half the patient under one non block excision for Y or marginal excisions. The medium survival overall in the entire cohort is only about seven years. So again, you know, chordoma is a deadly disease if you don't, it, uh, you don't achieve long-term tumor control. On block excision resulted in longer disease free survival, about eight years, whereas intralesional resection was about half that. And on block with even uh, tumor violation was much closer to intralesional excision. Uh, in terms of uh, the, another uh, study looking at uh, sacral chordomas, uh, again, a very large, the largest state of sacral chordoma from uh, multiple centers, 167 patients. Uh, y or marginal excision was achieved in 81%. Those that have Y or, uh, y or marginal on block excision has 63% uh, uh, percentage of uh, being alive without local or systemic control, whereas those that did not had significant uh, uh, shortened uh, lifespan and the risk factors for previous surgery or type of surgery, meaning uh, inappropriate, uh, indicating inappropriate surgery where they had intralesional excision or capsule violation. So going back to finish up, going back to that case, that case we had a very high suspicion this was a chordoma because we did a metastatic workup. This was the only site of lesion. We did a biopsy posteriorly close to the midline so that we can mark the track and plan that as part of a uh, procedure. 
Uh, this patient had epidural excision, so to try to get this uh, as a uh, Y uh, margin uh, on block would be extremely difficult. So we actually did a, a, a neoadjuvant treatment with radiation first using 28 fractions, then did a stage procedure where we uh, removed the posterior arch in on block fashion and excised the roots that we can, and then did a posterior uh, and then anterior stenotomy and cervical thoracic approach to remove uh, that tumor. And this is the post-surgical result from the on-block excision with a reconstruction of the cervical thoracic spine afterwards. So in summary, chordoma is a challenging disease that we deal with, uh, despite the fact it is where it is something we all see in our careers and, and, and those who have an interest in spine tumors. Uh, you know, I think early diagnosis is critical, getting a biopsy early is critical, and once you have the results, surgery should be planned with the goal of achieving uh, wire marginal on-block excision whenever possible. Thank you.